the holding screen that we keep up until
Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our roundtable series. This one is The Path to Residency, presented by the American University of Antigua College of Medicine. The series of live streamed webinars and roundtables bring you our own alumni who share their experiences. And this is a chance for you, the audience, to hear from them. My name is Par Prem Kumar, and I'm advisor to the president for special projects at the university. Today's discussion, Path to Residency, provides a very unique opportunity for you to understand the residency programs, the program directors, the hospitals, and what they are looking for when they interview you. Our alumni will also speak about their own residency experiences, about how they felt they were well equipped to handle the residency and how most of them are now finishing their residency in various great topics. The transition from medical student to resident can be very daunting, but knowing what to expect and knowing you have the support of your alumni who have gone the path before you can be very reassuring. We encourage you to reach out to our alumni, to email them through our alumni department and keep in touch with them. Today, we are going to start our conversation by a brief introduction with our alumni. A little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions for the alumni or for the university to answer, please type them in or text them in and we will try and answer them as quickly as we can. Let's introduce you to our alumni. First, we have our 2016 university grad, Dr. Sean Mahmood. Dr. Mahmood is an attending physician at Northwell Health Physician Partners. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sean. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Par, for the introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Sean Mahmood. Um, I am an attending with in family medicine. I'm a graduate from uh, Southside Hospital's family medicine residency program in Long Island, New York. I'm actually from Long Island originally, uh, and I went to undergrad at Stony Brook University. Uh, and prior to that, um, you know, I, after that, actually, I was a, an MBA student at Davenport University prior to matriculating at AUA. Fantastic. I didn't know that about you and the MBA. That's very interesting. Yeah, I know. I always had an interest in business prior to medical school, and I've realized that uh, that actually played a part into the rest of my career path, which I'm yes. sure we'll get into later. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Next, we have our 2016 grad. No, sorry, 2017. I'm sorry, I'm making you a year older than you are, Marlon. Dr. Marlon Coelho. Dr. Marlon is finishing his diagnostic radiology residency at SUNY Upstate Medical at Syracuse. Marlon, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, good evening, Par. Thanks for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Marlon Coelho. I'm um, originally from India, moved to Canada, did my undergrad there, uh, went to AUA for medical school, graduated in 2017, as Par said, and then I moved here to Syracuse. I've been here in Syracuse now. This is, I'm gonna be starting my fifth year of my radiology residency and um, going on to fellowship in nuclear medicine and abdominal imaging and intervention. Um, and that's that's brief, brief history about me so far. That's fabulous. I mean, nuclear medicine. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's really something you and I need to talk about off screen yeah. at some stage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then last but not least, we have a 2018 grad, Dr. Sri Lakshmi Gujala. Dr. Gujula is currently a chief resident, actually her last week of residency in internal medicine at Brooklyn Hospital Center program. She will be starting her GI fellowship almost immediately. Sri Lakshmi, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, thanks, Parra, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Sri Lakshmi Gujula. Since it's so long, I just go by Sri. I'm originally from Canada. Um, just like Dr. Uh, Marlin, I uh, went into the money call route. So I did two years in Moneyfall and then two years in Antigua, did rotations in America. And then, um, and then yes, I'm currently finishing my internal medicine residency in downtown Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Hospital Center. And where I'll also be starting my uh, GI fellowship. 
fabulous. So I didn't realize this, but I've got three New Yorkers along with myself. That's four <laughs> on tonight. It wasn't planned. I promise you, it wasn't planned. It just happened that way. But that's fabulous. So, okay, so let's start with what everybody's waiting to hear. The road to residency. Uh, when you start your medical program, of course, we all talk to you about, you know, matching. You have to match. That is the end goal. Uh, but quite honestly, I think it's there's a lot more to it than even we understand. Now, the road to residency, basically, um, I know it's very hard. You have to go through your steps. You've got to go through your various exams. You've got to pass. You've got to graduate, all that. So let me ask you, how... Uh, during your clinicals or later, how did you go about researching your residency programs? Marlon, let me start with you. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I actually figured out late, late along the path in my clinicals that I wanted to go into radiology. Uh, once I figured that out, you know, the, the thing that I did was to basically just kind of educate myself about all the residency programs that are in a certain area. Um, I know I knew at that point I wanted to be on the East Coast. So what I did, I kind of went state by state and kind of created a list of programs um, and just, you know, thought to myself, hey, you know, do I have a good shot here or not? And once uh, once I did that, I basically compiled a list of about 100 programs over that time that, you know, I was potentially going to apply to because, you know, for me, I was a Canadian grad um, and I was going to be coming in on a visa on a, in, in, in radiology, which at that time, um, and even now from what I hear is, is, is still challenging. So for me, I wanted to maximize my chances of getting into residency. So I, I basically, you know, cast a pretty wide net on the East Coast. And then I narrowed it down into, you know, certain states that I really wanted to be in. Uh, you know, that decision for me kind of base, was based on, you know, Proximity to family was kind of one of the main things I was looking right. for. So I, I chose states that were pretty close to the border that I could get home pretty easily. And then I narrowed down my list and then you basically sent out your application. So that's that that was in a nutshell my path. So so how many how many do you think you applied for or do you remember? I would say I applied to at least um, 100 radiology programs throughout the country. Uh, predominantly within the Midwest and the East Coast. I applied to pretty much every state on the East Coast. Um, and then I threw in a few in the Midwest as well. I knew I didn't want to be on the West Coast, so I didn't really venture out that far. Right. Uh, but but I definitely applied to programs in, in uh, Illinois and parts of the Midwest. Okay. So, so Sean, let me come down to you. Um, you're, you're a little senior uh, on the panel. And do you, do you think things have changed from what Marlon is saying. Did you also um, research and apply across the board? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the strategy that I employed actually leveraged a lot of the information that AUA put out. Every year, AUA puts out a match list. Yes, right? yes. So what I actually did was when I realized, I knew early on in my medical school clinical career that uh, I wanted to go into family medicine. Uh, primarily because I couldn't figure out what I liked best. I liked OB, I liked medicine, I liked peds. So family medicine, we could do it all, right? So it's like the jack of all trades in medicine. But what I liked was um, the fact that I was able to leverage where our prior grads had gone to, all programs that were friendly to AUA students. And okay. I actually used that list, cross-referenced that list with um, a annual conference that took place within the specialty of family medicine, the national conference, where a lot of residency programs show up to interview candidates potentially in a very informal setting. And I made it a point to target every single residency that was there that had taken an AUA graduate in the last five years. And I only applied to initially, I only applied to 50 programs, right? which coming from a Caribbean school may be a little like, you know, conservative. Yeah, um, yeah. But then towards the tail, like the day before the, the, the rank started, I just panicked because everybody was telling me they applied to a lot more. I applied to a, a bunch more programs. But of the targeted 50 that I spoke to, that I targeted from the AUA uh, uh, rank list, match list, that's where I got 25 interviews from. Wow. Uh, so, and then I was in a position to then pick and choose what I wanted to do which is very different than the typical 
you know, Caribbean yeah, student yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, again, you leverage the tools that are available to you, made available to you by the school, and you can carve a unique path that ends up putting you in the driver's seat. That's fabulous. That's great information. And wow, I didn't know that. 25 interviews. Good Lord. Great stuff, Sean. Great stuff. So, Sri Lakshmi, to come to you, I know you went to Manipal, uh, you know, you're from Canada, you went to Manipal, and then you came back. Um, when did you decide what you want to do? Um, that's a great question. So, I have always want, knew that I wanted to do internal medicine. I was interested in GI from the very beginning. Um, so, um, so, knowing that, um, and I also, like, did my internal medicine, like, um, uh, rotation as a med student in Baltimore which further fueled my interest in the specialty. So I kind of kind of always just knew that I wanted to go in this field. And then, um, and like Dr. Um, Sean, I applied way more <laughs> than 50, just knowing that because I'm J1 visa and like yeah. just the situation of the Caribbean med school and all the other things that are driving against us. Um, I applied to almost like I think 200 programs. Um, and then I was looking and then, uh, but then after that, based on the interviews and things like that, I targeted my interviews and my rank list uh, based on which hospitals had in-house fellowship, just because um, I, my end goal was GI. Okay. And I thought like, okay. if I was in-house, like I'll have higher chances of getting into those fellowships. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, I also wanted, to, I knew, also knew that like residence is a time where I want to learn the most. Like that's where, so I wanted to be in a place where I would see the sickest patients and do a lot of work. And, you know, but I be in a city too. That's why okay. I rank the work Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is this is what I meant, path to residency. One doesn't realize the work that is going in before the residency even starts. You know, the, the planning and the the uh, research and then the narrowing down and, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's just phenomenal. So, um, on the match day, um, Sean, this is for you. On, on the match day, I know you're probably biting your nails down to the quick, but uh, what 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 was your emotions like? How did it all pan out for you? So I remember, um, you know, because the way it works is on Monday morning you find out if you matched. That's right. right? Yeah. And yeah. then if you were successful in matching, you don't find out until Friday, right? Right. If you are unsuccessful, then you have the rest of the week to try to so soap or get a supplemental offer uh, yeah. into an, uh, an empty program. Uh, so Monday came about, you know, they say roughly like 11 a.m. or noon roughly is when the email shows up. And like, I think mine came in at like 11.04 and I was like, you know, just like a typewriter, you know, and, and, you know, I had, you know, I was thankful in that, again, like I said, I had a large number of interviews that I took of the 24 or 25 I had. I went on, I took 20 interviews, you know, I just dropped five that I knew I didn't want to go geographically to. Uh, so the statistics are that if you have at least 10 interviews, you know, the odds are in your favor based on how the computer system works for the match, that unless you bomb your interviews and you are a terrible in-person interviewer, you have a good likelihood of matching somewhere on your list. So I was pretty confident I was going to go somewhere, but then I didn't, I didn't find out until Friday where I was going. And that, when it came through, I got the top program on my list. So, oh, so I, I was thankful. It was great. It was celebrations all around. Oh, fabulous. fabulous. And Marlon, let me ask you, because I know coming from Canada and you know, you have the visa situation and everything. What, what were you, what was your situation like on match day? Oh boy. Uh, so for me, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. So I had, I had five interviews for radiology and, um, you know, so my story, even, you know, Sean and I both matched into residency. Our stories couldn't be more different than each other. So, you know, coming from Canada, being a Canadian grad, uh, applying to radiology at that time, people thought I was absolutely crazy, especially coming from a Caribbean med school. Um, and that time there was a, you know, a political shift, you know, 20, uh, what was it uh, when we were matching at that same time? So like the odds, you know, everyone was just like, no, there's no chance. There's no chance. I was like, you know what? I like it. I'm going to go for it. And like, you know, like Sean said, Monday, it tells you that you're fully matched. And I honestly didn't care at that point where I was going to go. I was just so happy. And like, I was just like, you know, against all odds, I was like, I, you know, I did it. You know, you know, everyone is just like, hey, you know, you matched. That's crazy. I, I was, 
I was willing to go anywhere. You know, it was for me, um, I, for me, it was to pick between five. Um, I liked all the five programs I interviewed at. I had a great, um, you know, interview in all five of them. So I'd be, I would have been happy any which way I went. Um, I was lucky. SUNY obviously was number one because it's a close to Canada for me. So, like, you know, the fact that I got that, you know, number one choice, got into RADS, you know, I, I couldn't tell you how happy I was. It was, it was incredible, really incredible. Aww. That's so nice. That's, I, I, it makes me feel happy when you tell me that you got your first choice. You know, I'm like, okay, we're doing something right. You know, something's oh, yeah. working. Something's working. Yeah. So, Sri Lakshmi, tell me, um, I, know you, I know you're a very calm person. So, how stressed were you on match day? I'm not calm at all, <laughs> but thank you for saying that. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just want to say, so. Maybe your net is, uh, Sri Lakshmi, your net is. You're freezing. You're freezing Hello? a little bit. Oh, I see. Can you hear me properly now? Yep, that's better. Better? Okay. So I just wanted to say one thing. Um, so I know Dr. Marlin from Money Paul. So he was like my senior. Um, and he gave me a lot of advice when I was writing my step one, even my residency application and things like that. So when we heard about his success, we were all so open. Like, um, radiology especially is like so competitive to begin with and as a j1 so it was very we're very very happy for him and then um, he also helped me like um just the j1 difficulties and the same need and all that stuff right so even though i matched like on that day when you match oh no she's freezing again sri lakshmi we lost you okay let's hope she comes back so one of the questions I keep getting and the admissions team keep getting is, um, do you have any yes or no questions to developing a strong personal statement? Um, I, I don't know why everybody's freezing. I don't know what's going on. No, Paul, sure. who are you asking a question to? Is yeah, no, I, I suddenly saw the screen froze. I was like, oh my God, what's happening? So Sean, tell me, especially now since you know you're going to be taking over your new position uh tell me in a personal statement for residency what what are you going to look for so obviously you know a personal statement needs to stand out right there's a there's a there's a, a slew of applicants that come in and something that is eye-catching right but you know not um I, I, what I could say too is that every program is different, right? Every program has different faculty. Every program has younger, or older faculty that read these letters. Um, I personally look for an applicant who is a little bit more like provocative, you, outside the the common, something that eye catching. I know from my personal statement, I had a quote. I quoted Kanye West. And it's also not exactly, you know, uh, <laughs> a benign individual, you know, um, so that could be potentially very, AUA, it's funny, AUA uh, told me that um, the individuals that help you with writing a personal statement said that she personally didn't like Kanye way, so she, her advice was to take it out, but I followed my gut and stuck, it, stuck with it, and, um, you know, I got the interviews, and I think that your story, you need to tell a story, right? Right. Don't, don't regurgitate your CV, that's what the CV is for. This is your time to tell a story. Tell a story that would stick in my mind as someone reading it, so that when I meet you, and I wanna meet you face to face to learn more about the story you told me, your path that brought you here, uh, I will then ask you questions about that. And that's what that, that happens. On an interview, if you get calls for an interview, you be prepared to answer anything that you wrote about in that personal statement, because right. you will be asked about it, because that's the story you projected to the residency yeah. programs. So a lot of the faculty called you in because they want to learn more about you. So be prepared to answer questions around that. Very well said. Yes. Marlon, anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. If I if I may, just one more thing. I think I think whatever Sean said was was spot on. And you know, I, I can tell you during my uh, interview experience, um, and maybe I was not prepped for this for the first one, but I really made sure I was prepped for the other ones was everything on your resume that, you know, from an academic perspective, everybody has very competitive scores these days. Everybody has a certain amount of research. Everybody has done some volunteer work. Uh, those are really, you know, obviously if, if you have a phenomenal score, you're going to stand out, but you know, 
a lot of people fall into a pretty, you know, pretty wide range of, of scores that makes you competitive for a certain specialty. Uh, and obviously every specialty has a different. One of the people that I interviewed with um, asked me the whole interview, I, I'm not kidding, 30 minutes, the whole interview was just about my hobbies, the, the hobbies that I'd listed in my resume. The whole interview was about my hobbies. And I, you know, I'd listed that I was a tennis player. I was a tennis coach. I love cooking. He asked me specifically, like, you know, tell me your recipe that you really like, you know, <laughs> tell me about your tennis career. Like you coach, like, you know, not everybody comes across a tennis coach, you know, who's applying for, for residency. So the one thing I really tell people, and I've done a bunch of interviews, like, you know, for my program, for people that have now matched at my place, you know, one of the things I always tell people is don't, don't make up things on your hobbies because that's really what, yeah. that's the personal aspect of you that they really want to know because you're going to have a good score. You're going to have a competitive resume. Uh, but you know, and I, the, one of the, one of the PDs that I interviewed with, the guy was the, one of the biggest tennis fans that, that I came across in the entire interview trail. And he's like, I even told him, I'm like, you make, I'll make a deal with you. You know, you give me a spot and I'll teach you tennis for free. And that's the <laughs> kind of interview that I had with these guys, you know? So, you know, so that's my, that's just one piece of, you know, advice I like to give people and what I would like to add on. That's it. That's it. True. True. So Sri Lakshmi, tell me about your personal statement and how did it go during your interview process? Um, yeah, sorry guys about the connection problems that I was experiencing. Okay. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Sean and Dr. Marlon. Those are great points. Um, in terms of my personal statement and my CV, um, I just went through uh, GI, like the interviews for the GI fellowships as well. Um, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. So my personal statement, what happened was I put like uh, varices are um, like, so I put, there was like a terminology that it didn't use properly and then one of the attendings actually called me out on my Yukon GI um interview he was like he was like I didn't know varices can be um clipped <laughs> and, I was like, and then I was like oh no and but then at that same time like the timer uh, the timer just ran out right and so I just laughed and then it just ended I was like oh thank god like I was saved by the bell right so um being very like people read everything they go through they really um do uh, go through um they like they go through everything. They actually really analyze like how you are as a person, um, all your stuff in the CV. Like um, they asked me like what uh, research I published, like what was the case about. So uh, just like Dr. Sean was saying, so everything that you put on your CV is fair game. So definitely review it. Like even like I think I got asked about a case report that I wrote when I was a med student like long time ago in my interview. So um, just to review all your uh, research stuff is very accurate. Um, another thing too, um, I think in interviews it's mostly like they're just trying to get a feel of who you are as a person or if there's any red right. flags. Um, and uh, just I think that's the major thing. I think if you're more um, and also an interview, uh, my friend told me this and I really liked it. It should be more of a conversation. It shouldn't just be like, um, and then you know how people like to talk, right? So then if you get them to talk and have a conversation, you'll leave like a lasting impression. Um, so I think those are all the uh, things that I noticed during my interview trail for both GI and internal medicine. Yeah, so yeah, don't make the same mistake I did. <laughs> really, really right, <laughs> what you need to do. You're so absolutely right. But I can also see how it would be so nerve wracking to go through your interviews. Uh, you don't, you're not sure what they're going to ask. You don't, you're not sure if you're going to be approved. You know, you're, it's so difficult. And you know, the three of you are absolutely right. When I used to do admissions, and I think Marlon might remember, I don't even know if I interviewed you. I probably did. Uh, I, you know, we read every personal statement that comes to us with the application. And I, I used to tell my applicants, literally, please don't give me more than one A4 sheet because, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing like 30 people and I cannot read more than 30, you know, of these personal statements. I, I won't remember, you know, but you're absolutely right. And I, I think I'm also guilty of reading the personal statement and picking on things which I don't think uh, you will remember and then asking those questions, you know, I'm also guilty of it. But yes. Because personal statement, I think, is very, very important for anything. It's not just for medicine, any any field. It's it's who you are. And that's that's the only the, the 40 minute slot is all all we have to understand you. Whether you're a good fit for the program, whether you, whether you're gonna make it as a doctor, are you gonna survive the AUA program? I have that 40 minutes to make my decision. So it's it's very, very, very important. Absolutely. 
So what, the interviews normally, is it like um, a panel? Sri Lakshmi, what did you have? Was it a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, for internal medicine residency, um, I had programs where, like, so in Chicago, um, I had a couple of programs where they did panel interviews. Okay. So um, that was interesting. So what happened was there was like five um, attendings, and then it was me and my um, other in uh, fellow colleague interviewer, um, interviewee, sorry. And then we were supposed to say um, like answers for each other. Oh. Um, so we had like five minutes to talk through like they gave us like a list of like questions that they wanted us to answer for each other so which I thought was interesting um there was other interviews where um uh it was just like one-on-one -on -one, or oh. it would be like uh but for my GI like in the virtual interviews I had like attending sit in one room because it's zoom right and with all right 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 so I had a lot of interviews where there would be like multiple attendings or in in one window uh -huh. Um, and things like that. Uh, but I feel like uh, the best thing to just go about it is just, I don't know, I feel like when I think they're my, they're my own people, they're my friends, I just, I, I just become myself and I just talk like how yes. I do. Yes. Obviously, and I feel like that just takes off the um, stress and awkwardness of it. The pressure. You just have to have a conversation and you just kind of, uh, you're, you're yourself. And I feel like people would value that more than you putting on a show. Like, I feel like people can, I think people um, at this point in, in life, they've seen so many different types of personalities. They've yes. seen so many different types of um, things. So I feel like how real you are and how genuine you are, I think that's very important. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I'm not sure, I don't remember whether Sean or Marlon brought it up, but uh, there is a generation, the older generation of doctors who, who do a different style of interviewing. And then you have the younger lot, especially like now Sean is coming on board and he's in a position to interview. His, his whole modus operandi would be different to talking to students. You know, it's, it's very difficult. And this is something, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a couple of chairs and we have a couple of senior doctors. And I always tell them, I said, have you forgotten what it was like when you were a medical student? You know, so your, your, the way you approach things, the way you talk to people, it's, it needs to be different now. Things are different. Things are so, so very different. So Marlon, what about you? Did you have any one-on-one -on -one interviews or were they all panels? Actually, all my interviews were were one on one. I I never had a panel interview. Um, I think the volume of applicants, uh, you know, for radiology compared to internal medicine is definitely much lower. Uh, there's there's thousands of applicants for internal medicine. Maybe not so much for uh, for radiology, but uh, all my experiences have been one on one, and uh, you know the uh, whatever whatever she said is it was spot on. You know, I'm, I know it's hard for me to convince people before they go into interview room. But now that I did, I mean, I did interviews for myself. I've been on both sides where I interviewed obviously for myself, for residency, for fellowship. And obviously I've done interviews now for, you know, to take on people. It's, it's hard to convince people, but I, I just go in there and I talk to them. Like I'm I just like, you know, I'm at a restaurant sitting across right. the bar. I'm, I'm having a conversation because the one thing that we don't realize is as much as we are trying to sell ourselves to the program, the program is trying to sell themselves to you because they yeah. want you there. The fact that you've gotten an interview at that program means like your foot is halfway in the door. Yes. So now it's up to you, you know, you know, and all you want to do. And, you know, one of the, one of the people told me, he's like, he's like, I really, and he told me straight up, he's like, I've not read your, your application as much as I probably should have. You know, there's other people that filter out all these applications. I want to just know that am I going to be able to work with you for five years? And that's it. Are you going to make my life miserable? Are you going to, or are we going to just work together? And, and that's literally what it came down to. He's like, you know, we are going to be family. You know, we are, um, my residency is a residency of six residents for every year. So we are less than 30 people, but we become a family here. And they're like, you know, I don't want you to come in here and, you know, we have a great setup. We want you to be a part of that setup. So they're trying to sell themselves to me as much as I'm there. And, it, you know, it took me a while to realize that. So when I went into my fellowship interviews, I honestly just sat back, talked to them, like, because I knew they wanted me as much as I wanted them right. at that point. Right. So and, I think when, when applicants realize that, it makes the interview process much, yes. much more manageable. It brings up your confidence level to know that you're also wanted, you know, as much as you right. want them, you know. Right. It brings up your confidence level. So Sean, now that you know you've been through the process and everything, and you know shortly you're going to be in a position of interviewing, how do you think your approach would be? So you know, um, 
I so it, I'm, I'm actually completing my fellowship. So I took a, the last year uh, as completing an administrative fellowship, right? So even after I graduated residency, uh, my track was always that I wanted to pursue a leadership aspect within healthcare. So I even what I would say was um, my interview for the fellowship, for that matter, was the first opportunity for me to not even talk about medicine and my medical CV, but yeah. where my leadership and where my business background and where my skills, you know, uh, parlay into leading a healthcare organization as large as Northwell, right? So now with the opportunity to now be in a position within the administration, within the operation of the health system, interviewing future candidates and talking to, you know, growing junior faculty uh, and developing clinical programs, my style is, again, I, I tend to be very informal, you know, I think this is just a newer generational uh, thing where, you know, I want to, what has happened, and I'll just, and I, not to give like a lecture here, but, no. uh, but previously medicine was siloed, right? So yeah. you had yeah. physicians, you had nurses, you had other clinical staff, you had non-clinical, and everybody's in their own little silos, not really inter, you know, uh, right. changing yeah. communicating. That has changed and how we function on the hospital floors. We now are in multidisciplinary rounds where we're talking with a variety of specialties from all different disciplines. So that has led to the, you know, uh, uh, the breaking down these barriers and more informally kind of working with a variety of non-doctors, non-clinicians. So I found that that was the element of which I trained in and I only can see myself emulating that when I am interviewing future candidates. You need to find someone that can communicate to you on a person-to-person -person level, not in a very rigid, you know, structured interview. I'm talking to a, a director here, and I need to be on my back. You should always maintain professional decorum. I'm not saying not to do that, but what I'm saying is be able to just talk in, as an individual because like, like Marlon had said, you know, the biggest thing that any um, individual who's in an interviewing position uh, as a candidate should be that you should be willing to sell yourself so that you can fit in, right? Because no program yeah. wants someone who's gonna rock the boat, want someone that's going to be an agitator, want someone who's going to be difficult to work with because residency is tough and it's high stress. Patients rely upon you to be able to care for them when they're sick as time. Hospitals expect you to do the work that's required of you and you can't have a outlier resident that's going to gum up the works and cause problems. I totally, I totally agree and I, and I really feel that this, you know, this batch of um, our students, our senior alumni, are going to make spectacular program directors and you know attendings and further because the the whole concept that you know you you broke the mold you went to a caribbean school to start with you're not the average typical us med grad you know you broke the mold to start with and so when you come in when you come into a place where you're in a position where you are now going to be talking to students wanting to come into your program your whole viewpoint is so different to uh, to a senior doctor or a doctor who you know graduated from India or Canada or somewhere like that it's so different it's so what, different. I, what I would say what I would say is that I find that individuals who come from offshore medical schools outside the United States in general I feel like our the type of candidates that we just generally are are more personable we tend to have personalities that oftentimes are not as pompous and arrogant because we know right. we, we've been humbled by our experiences that we experienced in Antigua um, and through the, ch the the processes in which we've had to endure uh, our studies and getting you know into rotations like everyone else and I think that translates to the type of candidates that you know come out of AUA and, and are on the interview trail and you know that's why every year after year AUA has a better and better match rate has a better and better match list yeah. more competitive specialties you know it, the evidence speaks for itself you know so totally and you know i think i think the fact that you go to a caribbean school itself you until you reach your residency you feel oh my god am i going to make it you know i hope i hope all the stories i'm hearing are only stories you know i do hope i'm going to match so i think yes you're absolutely right it's a totally humbling procedure you know to till you get to where you are and well you all are the success stories and one of the things that I'm finding now uh, in the past maybe three to four years that I've you know, taken over the alumni is that using you to mentor the current students is making a world of difference because they're actually hearing from you what were the problems you faced, what were the disadvantages you had. 
you know, and what, how were you received in the program? You know, you're from, from a Caribbean school and how were you received it? It's making a world of difference. So at the outset itself, let me say thank you guys. I mean, you make you make our lives a lot easier. It, it really, it does. Yeah, a lot easier. So let me talk a little bit about your experience in the residency program. You're an IMG. You're probably a foreign uh, foreign national, like from Canada or from India or wherever. Uh, and you are probably in a residency program with U.S. medical grads. So. Sri Lakshmi, tell me, um, what was your experience like throughout your program? Um, that's a great question. So um, uh, in my internal medicine program at the Brooklyn Hospital Center, we have uh, 30 uh, candidates, residents for each class. So it's a huge program. So it's like 90 of us. Um, and my experience, <laughs> um, so initially it's in downtown Brooklyn. So we were almost like almost like eight, nine patients every day. Um, it was definitely, we saw like very like, you know, diverse pathology, um, obviously along with the common cases that you see and a lot of social work cases and all that stuff too. Definitely a variety of um, medical cases that we got to see. And then just the, um, like you were saying how um, our residents were, um, there's US medical graduates along with the IMGs, along with, um, you know, from different countries and things like that, and which, and, and of different age groups as well. So it kind of brought together, um, we got to learn from each other because everyone had different skill set that they brought in. Like yeah. um, some were even attending back where they, um, you know, where they came from or studied from. So we got to learn from their clinical experience. And then um, along with, um, I think we kind of just balanced each other out. And there was a camaraderie and especially during COVID, like how everyone else went through, it just, um, brought that sense of togetherness and you with all this with all the stuff that's going on um learning from each other and forming connections and networking and everything like that the one thing is um there's also research um that i i wish i started earlier on as a med student um just because like for fellowships and things like that research is the primary um thing that everyone looks for um it's not about the scores as much it's about like research and how many publications you're doing. So that's uh, one thing that um, I, I would say New York hospitals don't offer the greatest right. <laughs> support in terms of like how much research you're doing, unless I guess if you're in a university program. So if that's something that you're looking for, then I would um, choose my programs in a different way. Um, but in terms of clinical experience and um, networking and the experience that you get, um, New York was brilliant. I would, I have no regrets. Fantastic, fantastic. So, Sean, um, what was it like in your program? Has it changed much, you know, from when you started? So it's a, it's an interesting question, actually, within my specific program. So um, uh, organizationally, so my program um, was within Northwell Health and Family Medicine Residency Program. And the, what happened is our, our geography with the footprint of the hospital had morphed over the course of uh, the last decade, actually, due to new clinical needs in the community. The hospital was converting from a community hospital where family medicine typically tends to thrive to a tertiary care facility where mm -hmm. multiple subspecialty services are offered. So the hospital actually transitioned family medicine out of the hospital. So our residency program, the residency program I graduated from doesn't exist anymore. They opened other residency programs that are more fitting to, they needed like GYN surgery, they needed ER yeah, emergency yeah. medicine. So but uh, but so in that element, you know, my program doesn't exist anymore, but not for anything that the program was bad. It's just the needs. At the end of the day, a hospital <laughs> has to serve the community that it functions in, right? You know, and it needs to make economic sense from a business perspective. Right. So, uh, that's kind of where that went. But, uh, you know, as a system, you know, there's still a, the biggest thing for me is that where I'm coming on board as a, as a leader with my health system is that means that there's not a lack of prioritization for family medicine, right? So, uh, you know, they would need me to grow clinical programs in the outpatient space, which is what my, one of my projects I'm working on right now around colonoscopy. So I have, you know, a GI uh, individual over here, you know, so I maybe use, if you, if you stay on the island after you graduate your GI, <laughs> GI docs out east of Long Island, you know, so. <laughs> He's already started recruiting, you know? Yeah, you know like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> Listen, if you graduate, I, I literally know of two spots open for you right now. We can hire you. So. Perfect. 
can you please keep them like open for me in three years as well? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of a program right now where uh, we're looking to have PCPs direct the colonoscopies for patients right in the GI. So um, the, the business will be booming. So yeah, so our program, although it's closed, it's an opportunity, um, you know, for new programs to open. And again, that means that there's more opportunities for students to match into specialty programs, right? Sure. Yeah. That's that's awesome. So, yeah, no, it, it, I think I think that if, like you said, programs are evolving. It's not what it was five years ago. It's constantly evolving. It's a business module now. Everywhere it's a business module, and we are finding it as we approach hospitals. It's no longer you know we need to do this for the community type thing. It's more a does it make sense for us to do it for the community type of attitude, which is a bit disheartening sometimes, but it's a need of the time. So Marlon, you went into radiology, which is, uh, as you said, difficult for an IMG, plus you're from Canada. So there was all this thrown into the mix. But once you started the program, what was your, uh, uh, what, how was the reactions and how did you adjust and how did you go forward? So my, my, so with radiology, you have to do a preliminary year first. So the first year of your training is a, pre a preliminary year in either internal medicine or surgery. I chose internal medicine because I just, I still don't know how to suture. So that, that's why internal medicine was the, <laughs> the thing that I did. Um, you know, so in our hospital and, you know, like, uh, like Shree's hospital, and Shree, thank you for all the sweet words before. That was, that was very nice. You know, these guys were all, you know, a couple of semesters below me and to see all of them match, they're all in fellowships now. That's, that's pretty phenomenal to see. I'm, I'm like so happy. We, we spent a lot of time together. So, you know, it's, it's really nice to see that, but, you know, so in, in my hospital, we have in our intern class is 75 residents and out of that about 35 are preliminary residents and, you know, about 25 to 30 are, are categoricals. Um, you know, my role when I first came in here, everything was inpatient for me, you know, so the training that I gotten, uh, during my clinicals was very helpful for that because the majority of the sub eyes that I did were, were internal medicine based, uh, very helpful. And we, obviously we all do our core rotations, you know, in internal medicine. So I felt, uh, obviously you never feel prepared for day one because you freak out when you give someone Tylenol on day one, but you know, you still come in with that, you know, at least an understanding of, I, you know, I, I know this, I know what I'm doing to a certain degree. And then for us, we basically switch from that and go into radiology. So it's it's like you're an intern for two years in a row. And my experience with radiology before I started was minimal. I did I did two rotations as a med student, one through AUA, one that I'd set up on my own. Um, and you know, just kind of like a sidetrack, those really help in getting interviews. So like I always tell people, if you can set up an elective at a place that you really want to go to. That's another method of getting into a program. I did that with one program in Ohio and they called me for an interview and I ranked them number two on my list because I really wanted to go there if not here. Uh, and so that's another thing. So radiology for me was just a whole different world. You know, you come from clinical medicine, you're talking to patients every day. You know, I'm a social person. I love that interaction with people. You know, I love taking care of my patients even for that one year. And then you go into a dark room you, you know, you sit at a desk for eight hours a day. You basically don't interact with a whole lot of people like you do in medicine. Uh, but, you know, now if you ask me to go back to medicine, I would never do that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, radiology is very different from, you know, from, from clinical medicine. And I have a lot of respect for people who do that up on the floors. Uh, but our job is, you know, hard, but in a different way. You know, we, for, uh, for us, you know, more than the physical aspect of the job, which obviously, you know, these guys deal with a lot of, Hours, like to look at a screen for 12 hours a day um, in order to not miss the tiniest thing on, you know, on the CT or an MRI, right. it, takes, it takes a certain like mental strength that you develop over time. You know, um, in your first year, you don't really feel that, you know, you don't have that responsibility and then it's a greater responsibility. And now I'm a senior resident and there are people looking at me, asking me questions, you know, that I'm supposed to answer and supposed to yeah. know. So, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's very, it's, it feels good, you know, it feels good to be in this yeah. position now where you've seen yourself mature over the, you know, the last four or five years. Um, and, you know, I always tell people, like, if you really know what you want to go to early on, try to do electives in that, try to expose yourself to that so that when you're first starting, you're not a fish out of water. And, you know, for me, radiology, I'm not going to lie, for the first six months, I felt I was so useless. You know, I felt like I was almost a burden on my senior residents because I'm like, hey, you know, look at this chest x-ray. Like, what is this, you know? 
uh, stuff like that, you know, but then you just, then, and six months later, you're that senior, people are asking you that question. So, um, it, the, the transition is challenging. It's not impossible. If I did it, anyone can do it. Um, but you know, the, you know, the thing that I always tell people, you have to be invested in what you want to do. Um, always push yourself, read more, read a little bit every day. If you feel like you're weak in something, read about that, come home, read about that. You know, it takes an hour, uh, you know, don't burn yourself out too early. Um, and kind of just kind of pace yourself and residency, even though it is alarming at times, you know, look at us We're we're all almost yeah, towards the end of our journey, you know, and, and, and we did it. So yeah, it's possible. It's challenging, but it's possible. So, so to piggyback on that Marlon, and I'll come back to the both of you, because I'd really like to hear your opinion on this. So before you started residency and when you were going through med school, you're doing your clinicals, you're getting ready for CKCS. Um, you have a concept in your mind about what residency is all about, uh, you know, and you hear from others, you're talking to others, you know, all that. And then you come out of medical school, you go for the match and you match. Yeah. Do you think, first of all, do you think that is residency what you had in your mind? And secondly, do you think that AUA with, you know, whatever prep we can do for you through clinicals and whatever, do you think you were prepared? Okay, so so let me go with so part one is was residency what I thought it was? No, it wasn't. So okay. you know, as a medical student, you basically have a very limited role. You're presenting patients, but you don't have that responsibility. And I think that you know the thing that 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 residency really teaches you is responsibility. And and remember, we're taking care of human lives. You know, the responsibility of someone's care is in your hands, whether whether you're doing it at the bedside or whether you're doing it at a screen. You know, mm -hmm. I do cancer diagnoses every single day as a part of my job. And, you know, I may not be the person that has to deliver that news, but I'm the person that, you know, diagnoses that news. So it, it affects all of us in, in, in the same way. Um, so, you know, residency is, it teaches you a lot of things. It makes you grow as a person. You know, I've, I've matured significantly. Obviously, I mean, I have a lot more gray hair now than I did about <laughs> five years ago. So I didn't expect that. Um, but, you know, I, I think the one thing that I really, it really changed about me was that, you know, that level headedness and that responsibility of going to work on time, knowing that you're going to be taking care of somebody's family. Um, and just kind of putting in the effort to do that. Because as a medical student, I don't think we think about that, you know, because you have an intern, you have a resident, you have an attending, it's it's their problem. You know, you're there to show up on time, kind of get your evaluations checked out, and that, that's that's where your responsibility ends. So so here you're that person that people lean to. Um and um and, and obviously I think Sean and and and, and Shri will probably be better people to answer that. But for me, like I said, for the internal medicine aspect of things, I, I felt like, you know, it prepared me. I did a bunch of sub in internal medicine. I felt like when I showed up on day one, I had an understanding of what clinical medicine was like. It was not like it was a brand new thing to me, um, you know, and, and from a radiology perspective, I did two rotations of radiology, so I knew what it was like. You know, right. it wasn't like I'd never uh, seen what radiology is, what radiologists do. I did two full months of that. So I had an understanding obviously I had a much better understanding for clinical medicine because of all the rotations, but um, I, I think I was ready. I, you know, I was excited to start. I, I thought I, w I wanted to get there. I wanted July 1st to come and I wanted to be, I wanted to have a longer white cord, white, white coat. So, you know, um, AUA does a good job, you know, AUA does a great job. And obviously over time, um, as the school has expanded, uh, the opportunities have expanded, the opportunities for rotations have expanded, the opportunity to go anywhere you want to in order to experience a different healthcare system. And let's be real, healthcare systems vary very differently across yeah. across states. So like for me, I did my rotations in four different states. So I learned a little bit about, you know, different systems in different states, which I don't think a lot of people think about. You know, Florida is very different from New York. New York's very yes. different from Ohio. So, you know, when I went in, and I think that's one of it, one of the benefits of being a Caribbean student. U.S. med school grads go to their affiliated hospitals in the same state nearby. Yeah. I did my medical training. I did my med school in India. Went to the went to Antigua for a bit. Uh, you know, I grew up in India. I'm, I'm also a Canadian citizen. So, and then I did rotations in four or five different states. So I was coming in with a with a knowledge base that my American med school counterparts Very didn't have. True. Very. So you know, I think that's actually a benefit for us. Uh, coming in. Go on. Yeah, no, I would, uh, I would echo that, uh, you know, 
as far as for me, I wasn't, I'm, I'm a New Yorker born and raised, so I don't have to worry about the J1 stuff, you know, so uh, I don't have that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say that the last, the last day of being a medical student and the first day of being a resident, there is a steep learning curve, right? You know, right. Uh, but I will say that AUA did a great job based on the rotations that were made available to me. I, mean, I did a lot of sub internships in medicine. Uh, I did all my core rotations and, uh, you know, it prepares you so that you can hit the ground running. Obviously, there's certain things you're going to learn that are just, there's no way the school can teach you. There's no way being a medical student, you'll learn it. You just have to, you know, this is one of those things where there are certain things you just have to pick up by trial through fire, right? Trial by fire, right? And what the school has done for me, at least what I could attest to, is that all of the challenges that go through studying in another country, right, living in Antigua, um, coming through and doing rotations, as Marlon said, in multiple states, right, so having to live out of a suitcase for a bit, and, uh, you know, that, that builds that level of perseverance, and you'll get through it. You've gotten through enough this up until this point. A couple of the years of just struggling through residency and just getting your work done and learning as you go, that's something else. You, you've done it before. You can keep doing it again. Right. And AUA does a great job in kind of fostering that ability to persevere through times of struggle and, and challenge. Great. Free? Um, I think Dr. Marlon and Dr. Sean did like they said everything. <laughs> so for a few points to that I wanted to add, and I agree with them completely, it's a few points that I just wanted to add that AUA definitely um, provides us is the constant change. And I feel like residency is that as well. There's, it's, it's constantly changing and you have to be able to adapt. And AUA really um, like helps you with that because just because like uh, the locations are always changing and like um, Dr. Malone was saying, like I did uh, uh, just like him, I did a lot of rotations at different states. I even did a couple of my electives in India. So I got to experience that healthcare system too, thanks to AUA. Um, so then be, be, uh, because of this experience in different um, experiencing healthcare systems in different um, areas, different countries, different states, um, it helps. It helped me a lot to tackle all the changes that were happening in the residency um, right. years. And the other thing too, it just helps you with all the alumni and everything too, and um, all the resources that you have. It makes you feel like okay, you can, you can just trust the process, right? Like there's so much support that you're getting. Um, there's so much um, alumni that you can reach out to, and all the networking that you can do. And um, I know Miss Kumar, even for my brother, you um, you know you're all, you you like call me up and you're like, hey, like how can I help? Or like with my friends, even they told me that there's so many resources out there, right? If they need something, like how can I help? Which I really appreciate it. Um, and um, I, the reason why I actually went to India was because like I was going through a family thing. And I still needed to make um, that year's match time. And I didn't know how, like, what to choose. Should I, like, just postpone a year or just just deal right. with my stuff first or, you know, or not waste a year and start match rate? And AUA at that time helped me. They were like, no, you can do electives in India and still, like, finish what you needed to, which I will never forget. And I'm very appreciative of. Um, I think, honestly, um, and then just, you just have to trust the process and, just take it one day at a time. And you just have to be okay with the fact that the more you know, you also know that the more that you don't know. <laughs> and that's okay, right? And you just have to keep it going. And that, that sort of resounds on what Sean said earlier. It, I think coming from AUA, coming from a Caribbean school, you realize that you're, you are humbled. You know, you, you've gone to a Caribbean school, you've taken a chance on this whole thing. You, you know, probably in debt for $200,000, but you know, you took a chance on it and that humbles you and that makes your learning curve a little bit easier. You know, you're not coming in with preconceived notions. I'm from a US school and I know everything that there is to know about everything, you know? So that, that definitely makes a difference. Now, while we've been chatting and having such a good time, I forgot to check all the messages coming in. Of course, I'm gonna to get told off for this. Now, the questions are just popping off my phone. So Marlon, this one is for you. I know you said you did some radiology elective rotations and you, you know, you went outside the box and you did some off AUA uh, uh, roster. How did you stand out from other candidates? What did you do on your resume to make it look different? So, you know, the, the thing that I focused on uh, when I was finding electives, like I said earlier, was to find an elective where um, has a residency attached to it. Um, you know, the one that I did in Ohio, um, and, and, you know, there's a general trend amongst programs, and I've noticed that in my own program, that if you have a medical student 
either from your from your home institution or from outside that rotates to the department, they are very favorable in inviting those uh, students back, you know, at least for an interview. And like I said, you know, once you get an interview, you're you're halfway there. You, I, I really truly believe that. Um, so one one real one piece of advice that I would really tell people is, you know, if you know early on where you want to go, or if you have an idea of what specialty you want to do, you know, target certain areas. Um, you know, just the way I did, and you know, I, I I stood out like the fact that you know I was there. They knew that I was interested in radiology. And I, I made it a point to show up there on time. At, I was there at 8 o'clock every morning, um, even though radiologists don't like you to be there at 8 o'clock because usually they're not there at 8 o'clock. Um, I always tell my med students now, you know, come at 10 or come at 2. You know, don't, don't come any time before that. Um, you know, and you have to show a commitment um, to that. You know, if you're there on time, people notice that. People notice good work ethic. And, you know, one of the things that, that we develop by going through different systems is we learn good work ethic because we have to adapt. You know, I we have to adapt to a hospital that you start a rotation and you do it for six weeks, you go to another hospital, and it's all, you know, it's adapting to a new environment, and we adapt pretty well. You know, so for me, you know, I started out with the fact that I was able to adapt, and I did my elective, you know, late on in my fourth year of medical uh, school. Um, so I'd been through all my cores, I'd been through a bunch of my electives. So so I was almost like a, like a seasoned medical student at that point. And, you know, like like I think Sean said, said earlier, you got to maintain a professional decorum. Uh, you got to show you're, you're going to be able to work hard, because that's the people they want. And... Uh, the fact that we're able to do that in different hospitals, adapt to different systems, I think really prepares us for that. Okay. So the other question that is coming up now, and Sean, maybe you're in a better position to answer this. What are challenges? What are the challenges trying to match in a specialty like oncology or dermatology? So specialties that are very competitive by nature one due to right. there's just not a lot of programs that are out there right so there's just a right. numbers game right uh and you know the fact that there tends to be for these specialties they can be more selective right they can tend to have higher score thresholds for usmle's uh -huh. right um, you know, if you really want to be competitive, obviously, if you know early on in your in your medical school crit, that is the path that you really want to shoot for, then the onus is on you to make sure that you get your ticket to admission, right, which is your step scores, right? You know, if you don't even get your step scores, then you don't, you don't even get a chance to you walk. Yeah. You, you, you yeah. can't even knock at the door, expect somebody to open, right? You know, so yeah. the step scores enhance you studying hard on the island, doing your basic sciences, getting in the best step one that you can get, you know, that allows you to then knock at the door. Right. Yeah, right. So right. then, you know, you would then have to hustle. Right. So the, the, the ability to um, get a, a rotational experience through clinicals. Right. We a lot of schools, even some U.S. schools have those students have difficulty getting rotations in dermatology and like uh, orthopedic surgery and other other specialties that are very competitive, right? So then that's where you need to then hit the pavement, as, as they say, right? Hit the ground running and just kind of reach out to programs, use the alumni network that AUA has. There are some residents that and graduates from AUA that have gone into very niche specialties, right? Yes. So, and we have a nuclear medicine radiologist coming yes. into the network, right? So, you know, anybody who wants something like that, you need to reach out to Marlon and say, hey, I saw you went to AUA, you know, what, what recommendations can you give me, you know? Uh, and that's that right there, like as Marlon said, if the department has someone rotating through, right, that comes from a school that produced another good quality resident, then, you know, the program knows that, okay, you know, we have less of a risk. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Someone, like, you know, the one that you do, you know, the, you know, if you have two candidates, you're going to always buy, there's an inherent bias that you're going to choose one that is less risky or risk averse, right? Yeah. So you're going to choose one that's less risky. So, uh, you know, the alumni network really, I think, one, do your research, what are the scores, study, get your step scores. And that, that's kind of what you need to do to get into a competitive residency. How much of value, Sean, do you think there is in, you know, uh, uh, networking while you're doing your clinical rotations? Oh, uh, how much of value is there in that? The value, you can't even calculate the value. Really? That, right? Okay. So networking is key. Every rotation that you're on as a student, consider it a job interview. 
right? An opportunity to interview, put FaceTime, right? So you're on a rotation for four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever the rotation is. You should take time to talk to the residents, ask them the questions. What is it like to work here? Make an impression with the attendings and then go and meet with the attendings and the program director and administrative staff and say, I'm very interested in your program. I'm here for a rotation. Uh, what, can, what do you look for in a candidate, right? And make it known to them that you're interested and then make yourself memorable so that when you then call back and then ask for an interview through the match process, you'll get one. You're absolutely right. I think you need to take the onus on yourself, take the initiative to, to network and to you know make sure it happens for you. There's the concept in medicine of being a self-directed learner, right? You don't mm -hmm. need to be spoon-fed the answers. You should, a, doc, a true clinician will never make it in this in, in their career if they expect to be handed the answers, right? You you have to be a self-directed learner, open a book read something you don't know and learn same thing goes in the process of getting a residency you have to be self-directed you know your objective is to match well you need to go ahead and take the steps for yourself no one's going to get you automatically into residency nobody's going to you know pull you up and say oh come you know just because you went to aua you are entitled to a residency slot no that's not mm -hmm. how it works right so you need to go ahead pull yourself up by your bootstraps right that's a that's a classic phrase uh you need to go ahead and put the work in to reap the rewards on the tail end with the match. You know, I think you're so right. And there is a there is a saying by Dr. Stephen Covey, and I don't know if you've read any of his books. It's like Seven Habits of the Most Successful Men, and you know things like that. But he he has written, you start with the end in mind, and then work towards that. And so you know, you you want to be an oncologist, fine, great, but start with that in mind when you start your program. That right there, exactly. That is that that speaks to my. I could uh, attest to that because that's what I. That's the same frame of mind I took. I knew that I wanted to be a clinical uh, leader, uh, not just a, a physician. I wanted to also utilize my business background. So I sought out programs that offered a fellowship that I ultimately got into. Right, same thing. And you back calculate, right? Yes, and yes, so what yes, steps yes. do you need to get to? Yes. So obviously, I want to get into a Northwell fellowship. I should match it a Northwell program. Right. So I'm going to make sure I reach out to all the Northwell programs and then prioritize that on the rank list and make your that. So that that, again, is the ticket. Sri, you agree to that? Um, hundred percent. That was so well said. Um, yeah, I'm in complete agreement. I think that same year I was I was interested in GI. So I was like, I knew it was very competitive. So like exactly like um, Dr. Sean said, you have to see like, okay, what are, what would um, allow me to have the highest success rate? Like what steps do I need to take? Yes, what do I need to network? Um, what research things that I need to get or like in-house fellowships and things like that. I think right. that's very true. Yeah. Right. And Marlon, I know, um, I know now you're going to do your rotation, your residency, and then you're going into your fellowship. Did you ever think that you would want to go back to Canada? network in Canada at all? Sorry, can you hear me? I, I don't know if yes, my connection is... I just was kidding. Um, so, uh, could you, so your, your question was, do you think I would ever want to go back to Canada? Is that what you said? Yes. So did you do any networking in the Canadian hospitals or practices to think about whether you'd like to go back? So, you know, in my immediate future, I don't think so. Um, you know, I've... Uh, you know, since I came into residency here, I've I've met I've met somebody who would uh, who would like to be here in in the U.S. So you know, decisions change. Um, you know, based on this based on what part of your life you're in. Um, sure. Obviously, you know, five years ago the goal was matching to residency, and then you know what that came and it went. You know, and then you're the next thing you know you got to match in the fellowship, but that came and went. You know, and it, man, it I, it's crazy how, <laughs> how time just flies by before. You know, I, I interviewed with you uh, part 2011 in a hotel oh, in Mississauga it? outside the airport. It was in a I hotel, right? It was in a hotel lobby I outside remember. the airport. Yeah. And you looked oh, at my goodness. personal statement and you didn't believe that I wrote it. You were like, wow, this is well written. Did you did you write this or did someone else write that? Um, but, you know, for me, I think, uh, you know, for me in terms of radiology, um, I think the best prospects for me um, are on this side of the border, at least for now. Of course, I still have family even in Canada. My mom lives there. My brother lives there. Uh, but, you know, the world is so connected now that even if I had to live in the U.S., I could always, you know, 
hop on a flight and be home that's true uh, in that's a couple of hours yeah uh, you know with, with the nuclear medicine and and abdominal imaging you know and intervention you know the stuff that i'm interested in i, I feel like the opportunity for me here is 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 it was much greater than it is in canada at this time uh, you know, Canada is 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 wonderful in in a lot of different ways, but there are certain aspects of the healthcare system that are very 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 different very uh, from America, uh, and in some in certain ways, you know, it's lacking in certain ways as well. So, I feel for me and in, in my career uh, moving forward, being here would be me the best choice. But, you know, five years down the line, I don't know where I'm going to yeah, be. Yeah, I, no you know. I think that's with all of us. We don't know where we are going right. to be five years down the line. What we're going to be doing, and life has a, a has a way of giving you some unexpected boomerangs and uh, right. speed bumps. So exactly. one never knows. Now I have a question which is really not, I'm going to read it out because it's not making much sense to me. So sure. this is from a student who's planning on applying. I'll complete my last pre-med courses in Jan 2022. I will start AUA August 2022. Should I study for a head start? If so, what materials do you recommend? I'm, I'm, I'm presuming she's starting med school in August 2022. So she's asking what she should study in between. Can I take this one? Absolutely, that, that okay? please. Uh, whoever the student is, please tell the student to enjoy every single moment they have between when they finish um, pre-med and starting medical school. Sure. And also between medical school and the start of residency. You need that time. You need that mental break. You need that physical break. Go on a vacation. Go go do something that you've really wanted to do. Because once you start medical school, it's 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 going to be a long process. You know, it's going to be eight to ten years of your life that you're going to be invested in. Yeah. And I can see, you know, all three heads nodding here. I think they agree with me. And obviously, I'll let them speak for for their experiences. I traveled so much between before I started AUA. Um, you know, I finished my, so I had done undergrad already at that point. So I had finished four years of undergrad. So I went directly into the basic sciences. I worked for a year and a half as a kinesiologist before I went to AUA. Um, so I quit my job. Once I got in, I quit my job. I traveled, I did a road trip. And then when I finished medical school, um, right from the graduation in, um, I think it was in New Jersey, a yeah. graduation ceremony in New yeah. Jersey. I did like a I did like a two week road trip between then and when I had to start residency. So please do not take a head start. You'll have enough time in medical school to open as many books as you want. You're gonna get overwhelmed by it. Enjoy your time and, and be it. mentally and physically ready when you start. Sean. Yeah, don't open a book. Go take a trip. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Don't do it to yourself. Don't do it. Sri, I guess you agree too. Huh? Oh my God. Yes. Please be happy because <laughs> mental health is like very important as well. And this is a, like, like everyone said, it's a long journey. So yes, <laughs> do what makes you happy. Yes. I mean, it's very important. I love to see that they're so passionate that they want to get a head start on it. Yeah. I understand that, but I get where you guys are coming from as well. Yes. You know, take the break, enjoy it before you start doing this. So let me ask you, um, one of the questions that came through was, uh, suggestions for preparing for residency after MD school. I know we went through the interview process, but I think what they're asking is, is there something specific you think they should do to prep for, for the residency pr uh, process for starting residency? Um, I, can I, I can take that. I'll, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll show what I did. So if, uh, if you have time between uh, the match and starting, um, so if you've successfully matched into a residency, right, that's in March, so, you know, residencies don't start until July, so you have a few months, assuming that, you know, you don't have some clinical rotations still left, and obviously you have to finish your school work to grad, you need to finish your requirements, yeah. right? So, but if you have downtime, um, you know, mental health break, travel, enjoy, that's obviously a given if you have the opportunity to. What I did, I, I had a couple months between when I matched and, and, and started, so I traveled, but then I also had to, I figured now's the time, let me knock out step three, right? I actually took care of step three and I was done. I, I took my step three in June, July 1st, I started. All of my co-residents were busy trying to study and use their vacation time to actually study for step. I was taking my vacation residency and actually traveling, right? So if you can knock out this exam, because yeah, everybody has to do it, right? Yeah. So, you know, if why 
do it during residency and, and use your limited free time to have to study when you can knock it out before residency starts and be done and be free with that, you know? That makes yeah. absolute yeah. sense, absolute sense. So the other question which has come up is, how do you think the match process will differ now that it, is, it might go into a pass fail step, step one? Any one of you? Uh, I can. I can chime in on that. So, you know, I, I think it's going to get, I think it's going to get more challenging personally. Right. That's, that's my, that's my thought process on it because before, you know, people had a filter set and, you know, they could really restrict the number of applicants that they could take in based on a certain range of scores that people fell into. Um, you know, and also now because, you know, a pass or fail, I feel like programs are going to get a lot more applicants. Uh, per program than they probably did before, just because, you know, for example, like, you know, for me, I knew uh, that, you know, if I wanted to get into radiology, I had to get a certain step one and step two score. Right. And if I wasn't there, you know, I would not even have gone down that route. You know, and I think every specialty historically has a range that people know unofficially, um, obviously programs have their own filters and we never know what happens behind, you know, behind yeah, those yeah, lines. But course. so I, I think now the goal is to really focus on having other aspects of your application that stand out. So obviously a pass fail, um, you know, most people I feel like if they're going to pass, it's going to be the majority of people and there's going to be a lot more applications. So now I, my, you know, my advice to people is focus on things that make you presentable to a program beyond your application. And what that mean, what I mean by that is, you know, really, you know, focus on building your personality to try to match you know, uh, because every every program is looking for a certain personality trait. Obviously, and then Sean hit on that earlier. They want to be able to work with you. You got to be friendly. You can't be an antagonist. You know, work on things within your personality that you know stand up. You know, work on your resume. Um, if you can get involved in doing things that show up on your resume, uh, it, that, that 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 people say, hey, you know what, this guy is different, or this girl is different because he or she is doing this. Um, I think those I think those things will be helpful and. And, and like I said, you know, a lot of it goes beyond academics. You know, every like you know, I said, and I really stressed on that earlier. And I stressed on it when I was interviewing applicants. I don't, I don't really care what your step one scores are. I don't care how much research, research you've done. You know, tell me about yourself and how you will make my program better uh, from a personality standpoint. And I think if people start to focus on that, and I think the real thing is going to be the person statement at this point. You know. Uh, the personal statement is that kind of that gateway into people getting to know you as a person. And, uh, you know, I, and my, you know, and this might sound cliche, um, make your personal statement personal. Like if, you know, if people read my personal statement, it's extremely personal. And I don't hold back on information because I want them to know who I am. I want them to know who they're going to get for the next five years. I don't want to cheat them on that opportunity where I present myself right. as one person and show up as another. You know, I'm I'm an honest person, and I and I give them an honest look as, you know, from both a strengths and weakness perspective. You know, and and I think that if people are able to do that, I think that'll really help kind of put their application and kind of make them stand out a little bit better. I just wanted yeah. to, to just yeah. chime in one. From my understanding, and I think it's it's important to know the. Only thing that's changing is USMLE step one. That's going to correct, correct. CK is still going to be a numerical score. Yes. So I think yes. what's going to happen is that there's going to be a shift, which traditionally, you know, my own opinion, and you know, my opinion, you know, USMLE doesn't really listen to me. So, uh, but <laughs> the step one was really, you know, it it doesn't really, in my mind, bear clinical co connection, right? It like it doesn't right. tell how good of a doctor you're going to be. That doesn't judge your clinical skills. No, it does ju judge your basic science skills, right? So pass fail, fine. The onus is going to be now, there will be much more scrutiny on the CK score. That will be the one that you need to focus on because that does have a linear correlation, uh, a direct correlation to how you will manage yourself as a clinician, right? Because, you know, there's skill sets that you need to develop and you'll match, they'll test that with a three digit score on the CK exam, right? Uh, so I think that what's going to happen is that there'll just be that much more pressure on the CK component um, because that's really, at the end of the day, a better gauge, a better barometer for how you would be as a potential intern starting into a residency program. I think you're absolutely right. Um, just, just um, you know, I think people are worried because it's the unknown at the moment. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the timing of which, you know, you got to get your step one done, pass it right and get your rotations going and be able to sit for the ck 
as soon as you can and score as well as you can, right? And uh, that is what's going to, I think, open a lot of doors for you come uh, interview cycle. Great. So we're coming down uh, to the last couple of questions. And I have one question for each one of you. So, Sean, this one is for you. How do you feel you have done when it comes to supervising new students, residents coming in? And do you think the new residents are better prepared than you were? Uh, so, you know, I've, I've had junior uh, residents, uh, med, med students as well. I think, um, you know, in terms of preparation, I've had students that at the end of the day, they're strong students, and I've had students and residents that are a little bit weaker. You know, it just comes with the nature of, you know, having a diverse candidate pool. Um, I do think that their social determinants of health, right? It's a, it's a much more, you know, the elements that go into healthcare and well-being outside of, you know, just like medications, you know, how people come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And in today's society, it's as polarized as it is, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, factors that take race into consideration and the disparities in healthcare equity, right? Um, you know, our, I feel like the students nowadays that are going through education, a younger generation are more exposed to the challenges in society, uh, are much more equipped to be able to tackle these issues and are way more educated than some residents and senior faculty that are out there in some of the challenges that face, you know, the indigenous populations in the United States, you know, that are oftentimes the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenged in getting equitable access to healthcare. So I think that yes, the newer candidate pools are much more connected uh, uh, to that than I think my generation or, or years prior to me are. That's that's really you know it's um, it's very heartening to see that the new generation are you know taking a little bit more. Um, I know there was a joke when you know very early on in AUA that you know people apply to med school because they watch Grey's Anatomy and they watch ER and. Uh, they think it's very glamorous, you know, in that you're going to meet Dr. McDreamy and you're going to meet George Clooney and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But it's changed. The paradigm has definitely changed. Uh, you know, the new generation. I mean, listen, that element is still there. What? You know, you know I, I watched, yeah, I watched yeah. ER. ER was what got me to go to AU. <laughs> you're one of those. Take that away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but you know, I really felt ancient when I was talking to somebody and I talked about Dr. McDreamy and they said, who? And I was like, okay, I shall now shut up. I'm not opening my mouth anymore. So Sri Lakshmi, I, this is for you. What are the top three things you wish you knew about being a residence or the residency experience before you started? Oh, wow. That's a great question. What did I wish that I knew? Um, first thing is, I wish I took step three, just like how Dr. Sean did before residency started. I took it, I'm, uh, I took it in second year and I was and on ICU nights and it was just, it was, it was a mess. So I definitely wish I um, did that before as well. I completely agree with this advice. The second thing um, I wish I knew for residency um, is um, the amount of like um, there's a lot of administration side to it, like a lot of hospital politics, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things. It's not like, I guess I'm very, I was very naive and gullible and I was thinking, oh, okay, healthcare is going to be, um, um, I, I thought I just, I just like elevated in my head, thinking right. of how it's, but then just like any system, it has its own flaws. It has a lot of players and there's a lot of things going on. And, um, uh, I was definitely, I think re I was definitely hit by reality. Um, early on but saying that I think once you know like what to focus on just focus on like you know learning as much as you can um you have to uh, filter out all the negative negativity and just focus right. on like what you need to do how like what uh, what your goal is to be the best um you know be the best doctor you can be and just to gain whatever you can and the second thing and then that the third thing is um just trusting the process I feel like I overwhelmed myself a lot early on just because there was you just, I, I feel like when you put too much expectations on yourself and um, you try to do it all um, and then mental health and having a balance of your personal life and your residence life, I think that's very important. I wish uh, I walked in thinking that, hey, let's just take it day by day. Um, let's right. make sure we have a balance of um, both like the personal life and also like just yeah. take time out for yourself and do things for yourself too and make sure you maintain all of that. Um, I think those, those are the three things that 
I definitely mm-hmm. would have told myself. And I think I think that's something all of us do. We put ourselves yeah. under undue pressure. Mm-hmm. And then retrospectively, we think about it and say, why was I putting myself under so much yeah. pressure? You know? <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. So Marlon, what advice would you offer students who are just starting this journey, both through academics and clinicals? So I think through academics, uh, the main focus is getting good scores. Um, you know, I always I always tell people the step one score is one of the only things is once you take it, it's gonna, step one, not the score, but then now step two is a score that stays with you for, for the rest of your life. It's not a score. Once you pass that test, it's not a score you can ever change. You know, you can't, you can't regret on it. You can't cry over spilled milk. So I think, you know, the focus should be as a medical student is you know, really focus on those exams uh, because they can really define your career. You do well in those exams. You've opened up so many doors for yourself and so many opportunities will just come knocking and you'll be surprised. You'll actually be surprised if you do well in those programs. Want, programs want those kind of people. They really, right. really do. Right. You know, because as much as it is a number, unfortunately, programs have only that as an objective uh, measure in order to compare you as to somebody else. Now, I don't believe that, you know, someone who gets a 250 is a better doctor than someone who gets a 240. But from a program's perspective, they're going to use that to say, hey, I think the 250, let's give the 250 guy a chance over the 240 or the 230, something like that, you know? So we have to really, there are elements of the system that we will continue to fight against uh, just as medical students in general. And one of them is standardized testing and, and and standardized scores, you know, and that's not something that's going to change. Obviously, the the paradigm has shifted for step one, but it still stays the same for step two. So I would tell medical students from an academic perspective, really, really focus on getting good scores because that can really define your residency match process. From a clinical perspective, stand out, you know, just don't, don't be afraid. And, you know, early on, I was, I was afraid because I felt like I didn't know enough, but what I didn't realize is people didn't expect me to know much because that's, I was a medical student, you know, yeah. I was in training, I was there to learn. And I felt like when they called, called me out on rounds, I was supposed to know the answer to everything, which is not the case. You know, you learn that over the process of two years in your clinicals, over three to five years in your residency, you learn that, you know, it's a learning graded learning process. So my thing, you know, is make connections. Every rotation that you go into, make connections, whether it's within that hospital, go to the program, go to the program coordinator, say hello. That's all that, you know, all you need to do. You'll be surprised how just going to somebody and saying, hey, my name is Marlon. I'm interested in your program. I really like you here. I want to come here. How much I can do for you? People remember that. People really, really remember that. Um, The program in Ohio that I interviewed at, they remembered me when I went as, you know, for my elective. You know, I went out for lunch with the residents. They all knew me like I was a resident there. You know, it was, it was great. It was, it was like a comforting experience, um, you know, and the one thing is make your work count, you know, show that you are capable, not, no one's expecting you to know everything, but make sure you have the effort. Go be the first person there, be the first person around, be the last person to leave, do your notes, do your clinical exams, continuously learn from the residents because they obviously know a little bit more than you. And, you know, in turn, knows more than a medical student. And obviously it kind of goes up to, you know, being a senior resident as an attendant. Learn from everybody, learn the process, learn their way of things and mold yourself because, you know, the transition from medical school to residency happens within a span of two months, maybe right. less for some people, you know? Like, you know, you have to be ready. And obviously if you mold your personality, you take kind of aspects from different people. That's what I did. I took, you know, little bites from different people. You say, hey, I'm gonna try to read the chest actually this way. You know, I like his style. I'm going to do my physical exam this way. I like, I really like the way he did it, you know, and you formulate your own methodologies. And, you know, once you have that process in place, life just gets easier, you know? So when you're in your clinicals, formulate that process for yourself. And, you know, when you start on day one, people will know, your attendees will know, hey, wow, this is this, he's a good intern. You know, he's a good senior resident. He is the person that I want to hire for, you know, my institution. Those things go a long way. So... Uh, that's that's my advice. Fantastic, you know, talking to the talking to the three of you and hearing so much about the residency, it's it's been a huge learning curve for me too, because there's so many aspects of the stuff you guys are telling me that I didn't know about or I hadn't even thought about it, you know. And that's that's where our students are because they don't know; they just know, okay, I'm in med school, I'm going to get my MD, and I need to match, 
They don't know anything beyond that, which is why this path to residency was so important because they, they all have questions. How is it? How is it? How is the residency? Um, is the attending mean to you? You know, how's the program director? You know, are you, are you just a drop in the ocean? You know, how do you stand out? These are all questions, genuine questions. But anyway, first of all, let me thank the three of you for taking time out from your schedules and coming on. It's always a pleasure. And I think, um, I, think I know all three of you from, I, I think from when you started the medical school. So we go back a long way. We go back a long way. And it's really nice. It's very heartening for me to find your success. You know, so I, I, I shall glow in the success by default, you know, so, you know, without doing any work. But thank you very much. And I want to thank the audience who have been sending in questions and have been listening very attentively. I see a very large number of eyeballs on our program. Please, this video will be posted on Facebook and on our website so you can listen to it at your convenience. And again, please follow American University of Antigua on all the social channels. We are there on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and we are constantly posting our alumni. And if you'd like to speak to any of our alumni, please do write in to alumni at auamed.org. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>